I'd like it to be, but I think it will suffice. So. <clears throat> we hear you loud and clear. Okay, good. Yeah, let's see here. And uh, Mr. Carter, I see you're on board here, so we're good there. Yep. We're good. Uh, and it is seven o'clock. Shall we roll on? We're all ready. Okay. Great. Well, good evening. Uh, Mike Valencourt uh, here. I chair the uh, Town of Cape Elizabeth Zoning Board of Appeals. I'll call uh, this uh, evening's meeting to order. It's Tuesday, July 28th, uh, 2020, and we're doing, I don't know, our third or fourth meeting via, via Zoom. Uh, and we have uh, a few different agenda items, only one new business item this evening. Um, first, uh, we, we want to consider the the minutes from the June 23rd, 2020 meeting um, and hopefully approve those. Uh, I suspect everybody had a chance to review those minutes. We received those, I don't know, within the past couple of days. Uh, and I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Uh, of course, if there are any uh, friendly amendments, we can address that as well. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Kevin. Second. We've got a, a, a second from Michael. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the minutes? Uh, I'm in favor. Mike Valencourt. Joe Barbieri. I'm in favor. And I'm in favor. Michael Tadamo Wheeland. Tom Powers in favor. Uh, Matt Kane in favor. Very good. Okay. Motion carries uh, unanimously. Uh, uh, we have no old business. The only item of new business this evening is to hear the request of Patrick Cotter, owner of the property at 5 Thrasher Road, map U32, lot 6-5, to create an accessory dwelling unit by adding an addition to an existing single family dwelling based on section 19-5-5 and 19-7-5 of the zoning ordinance. Uh, I'll turn to uh, Ben McDougall, our code enforcement officer, to offer us a, a quick briefing on the uh, application. Good evening. Uh, Mr. Cotter came to me a few months ago uh, wishing to set up an in-law suite for a family member. And he's proposing a 383 square foot accessory dwelling unit on the rear of the garage. He is in the RC zone. Uh, his lot is conforming. It's roughly 30,000 square feet. Lot size required in that zone is 20,000 square feet. Uh, the lot size required for an accessory dwelling unit is 12,000 square feet. And he submitted a standard boundary survey showing approximately 30,000 square feet of land area. The, uh, the addition on the back of the garage is clearly conforming to setback requirements. He's also proposing a, a mudroom addition uh, as, as well. Okay, very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Carter, do you wish to, uh, to present this evening on your application? Sure, first off, uh, thank you all for coming on this very hot evening. Hopefully everyone's sitting in air conditioning. Um, this is kind of different for me. I, I work in code enforcement, so I'm usually on the, your side of the table, not on this one. So uh, hopefully I can stay on task and get this through as quick as we can. Um, essentially, my wife and I are looking to build, a, like Ben said, an ADU in the back of our garage. Um, this is for my mother, who's uh, lived here for 36 years. Uh, basically, give you a reference, we moved to Cape Elizabeth when I was in kindergarten, and I graduated from Cape High School in 95. So if that tells you how old I am. Uh, my wife and I bought this house about five years ago. Um, February, my father passed away. Um, my mother really does not need the size house that they have. They don't have a really big house, but everything is on the second floor, bedroom, bathroom. There's only one bathroom in the house. Um, and when COVID hit, basically she became my, um, at then first grade, um, first grader in Pong Cove's teacher. Um, because I work full time for the Sanford Fire Department, so I was at work every day um, during that. Plus, and my wife works in insurance, so she was um, here. So my mother gratefully took the teacher role and uh, somehow did not kill my son in the process. 
Um, if anyone's had teaching kids at home, it's not as easy as it looks. Um, my mother would like to age here in Cape Elizabeth. Most of her friends are here. She belongs to Rotary. She, I mean, she volunteers for the, um, the voting polls here in town. Um, all her friends are here. Um, so basically, like Ben said, we're, we're, we're basically asking for a small ADU on the behind our garage. Um, from the street, from Thrasher Road, you really won't even see it. Um, our side neighbors uh, will see it. We've we made sure that the siding will be exactly the same that's on the house. It's going to have the same color. We even stepped down the roof from the uh, garage to the ADU, so it's not one long piece of block, I guess you could call it. Um, we'll have some small windows on it to break it up, so the side neighbors won't see um, won't see just a big wall. Uh, we're going to have the additional parking in it that's required is going to be our turnaround, which we never use because essentially Thrasher Road is a dead end road. Um, only people that live on Thrasher really come down Thrasher. So um, like Ben said, we're basically, this will be two permits. Um, the first is um, like everyone in the world, we need more uh, uh, storage area. So we're basically expanding our mud room. Um, we are adding a washer and dryer. That's for twofold. My wife and I purposely bought a house that had a first floor bedroom and bathroom because um, we plan to age here in place also and having a first floor washer dryer makes more sense. My job, I am also the fire investigator for the city of Sanford. Um, essentially after the fire goes out, I literally dig the entire scene. Um, so I am covered and I'm trying to make sure that I don't take what I bring home into the house. So the idea is that I can have a place I can just take the clothes, chuck them in that particular washer, wash them, and that way it's safe for my family. Um, that's pretty much it. It's a, a pretty simple project. Ben's been helpful. I screwed up reading the the uh, uh, my reading of the ordinance um, a little bit, and he kind of helped me get through that. So, um, do you have anyone have any questions? Oh, we may we may well have questions. Um, let me uh, let me ask before we get to those those questions and that uh, any additional follow up on this. Ben, uh, did we get any submissions from uh, members of the public, emails, phone calls, anything like that? No, you're you're on mute, but I'm seeing you shake your head now. We no. did not. Okay. And as you guys know, this whole Zoom thing is still figuring it all out. But I don't see any other uh, members of the public participating who might want to comment. If it, any of you see anything like that, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't I guess see any attendees. I see nine panelists, which is all of us, uh, Carmen and the applicant, and no other attendees. Okay, very good, very good. Uh, Joe, I think I saw your hand going up with maybe some questions on the, on the application. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, Mr. Crocker, uh, as you probably know, we have to make certain findings in order to approve this as, a, as an ADU. And in looking at the application on, on the back of the, the application, it's, it's pretty much blank as to um, the information that we need to make the findings. Now, I, I understand some of these aren't necessarily applicable, but it seems like we, I think we kind of at least need to go through the motions um, of showing that those, those requirements have been met. And, um, you know, I think it's the applicant's duty to do that, uh, not, not Ben's or, or ours. So I would appreciate if you could just go through those and tell us um, how those requirements are going to be met in this case. Sure. Um, I actually made an attachment to that because if you saw my handwriting, you'd all be scratching your heads. Um, so I can I can go through what I typed out. Uh, apparently, it didn't make it to you guys, but that's okay. Um, my wife and I are. It, 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 oh, Patrick, it did make us. It yeah. did make its way to us. But please feel free to go ahead. Okay. And I mean, I'm more than happy to go through it. Uh, number one, um, I actually don't even have the application for me, but I do have the typed out. Uh, my wife and I are asking to build a 383 square foot accessory dwelling unit in the rear of our home. Uh, the connection will be provided by expanded mud room um, that is, will be a, on a separate permit, as I said. Uh, the accessory dwelling unit will be built for my mother, who's lived in Cape Elizabeth for over 30 years. We actually figured it out it was 36 after we did this. Um, our lot size is over the 1,200 square foot required by the city. Sorry, I put city. I meant town. I work in a city, so I put city for everything. 
um, to build an accessory dwelling unit. Uh, number two, the traffic on Thrasher Road is very light. My mother is retired and will only be adding uh, one additional vehicle to the household. Uh, she'll be parking in our turnaround, which is shown on the, uh, on the plan, um, on our driveway, which we really currently never use. Um, the new accessory dwelling unit will be connected by the public sewer line. Uh, the exterior addition will be built to match existing colors uh, as the rest of the house and same siding. Um, although we might, we will probably use this, we may uh, reside some of the house while we're at it because we have a contractor and anyone trying to find a contractor lately is uh, good luck. Um, the, the, additional, the addition will just be for residential use um, as it has been, we'll stay that way. Um, and from Thrasher Road, for number five from Thrasher Road, once the addition is built, um, the design, we took great care of um, not to change the overlook of our home. Uh, the design calls for a step roof uh, that will break up the wall viewed from the side yards from my side neighbors. Um, and I've shown all but one um, the plan just because I'm fairly friendly with them. And they all agree that it will, they don't have a real big problem with it. And they're the only ones that really can see anything. Um, if you have any other additional questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Kevin. Um, I, I just do have one. One of the considerations is the slope of the land on, on your property. Again, I don't think this is a, a major issue, but I just did, wanted to make sure we addressed it for the record. Can you roughly show us how, how the land slopes in that back part of your house by the garage? Uh, it's fairly flat. There's, there's probably a, maybe a four or five foot drop in elevation, um, just kind of going down. Um, Honestly, we'll probably take some of the fill and fill in some of the, um, we have kind of a, some weird divots and stuff like that. Um, mostly because my son will try, will, will find that one divot and twist his ankle every time he's out trying to play football. Is uh, your yard so there? Is it mostly grass? And it's it's all grass maybe? right now. Okay. And we'll, we'll retain that grass. Um, the only thing that we may do um, just to prevent mud season problems, because uh, like I said, I have a seven-year-old son and a dog. Um, we may put a small patio in front of the back door, um, but that might be two, three years down the road. Okay. And then one, one just other point, and I don't know if the, this isn't really a question so much as um, uh, for you, Mr. Connor, maybe for Ben, or maybe we just address it in the findings of fact, but I did notice the application didn't have RC zone on it, and the, the draft findings of fact didn't have the RC zone. I, I think we should have that somewhere. I think ideally it would be on the application, but if it's the findings of fact are fine, I have no, I, I, I don't care either way. I just think it should be somewhere in there. Yeah, absolutely. Add that to the findings. But, but that's that's all I have. I mean, I don't, I'm, I'm supportive of this. Kara, I have a question. Uh, go ahead. True. Sure. I, go I don't know if says go ahead. <laughs> Mr. Cotter, this is Matthew Caton. Um, good evening. Um, I'm looking at um, one of the requirements under um, section 1975, uh, and these are the requirements to get the ADU. And one of the, the issues is that there's no home occupation or home business there. And we talked about you and your, uh, and your mother being retired, you weren't from the fire department. Could you just briefly comment that your, your spouse will or will not be uh, subject to that home occupation requirement? So she, when she works, it's outside the house? As long as there's no COVID closing, yes. It's just like everybody else. She, she's been working at home. Um, she works for Noise Hall and Allen Insurance. They're down in Mill Creek. Yeah. Um, uh, you make an excellent point. Uh, I think the ordinance is talking pre-COVID. Um, Pre-COVID, yes. Yeah. So, so, uh, so no, there's no one who works here. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's all my questions. Thank you. Further questions? Not seeing any. I, I don't have any questions myself. I thought the app, application was pretty well organized. I think it uh, hit on all the uh, key parts and points that we need to understand in order to make a, an informed decision. Um, if there are no further questions for Mr. Cotter, then Mr. Cotter, you can stand down for the moment. Of course, reserve the right to ask you additional questions if anything comes up. Um, understanding that there are no additional public comments and that 
our code enforcement officer hasn't received any additional um, emails or phone calls or anything, I think it's appropriate now for the board to consider the application. Thoughts in that, in that regard? Joe. Um, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Um, uh, I, I'm, uh, a few months ago, we had a, another ADU project, as I recall, and I, I made allusion to a concern that I had, and I just wanted to bring it up again. Um, the purpose of allowing an accessory dwelling unit is to allow um, uh, an incidental use to an existing single family dwelling, and that they are intended to be um, a situation where the unit is occupied by one or two persons who have a close personal relationship with the residents of the main dwelling. And that is the reason why we even have jurisdiction over this, this project. If there was no condition, we wouldn't even, um, we wouldn't even uh, be, be looking at it. And that is why there are all these various restrictions about square footage and coverage and all that, because there's an apparent intent on limiting ADUs to this specific purpose. And my concern is that if we don't impose a condition requiring that this owner or future owners adhere to the um, ADU um, purposes, then uh, they can easily be um, dismissed down the road. Um, for example, you know, if Mr. Cotter were um, uh, to sell his property, what would be to prevent the next owner from simply coming in and renting that project to someone else, or for that matter, as Matt just pointed out, um, conducting a home, home business occupation. Um, there, we simply, once, we, once we've approved it, it seems like unless we impose a condition, we've lost control over this. And we, it kind of deserves the whole purpose for having this limited review of ADUs. Now, I, I do want to say that as a matter of policy, there's a lot of cities out there who think ADUs are a really good idea for limiting or, or for helping out, you know, um, rental shortages. Uh, and they have allowed it to go, you know, fairly expansively, but that's not the purpose as Cape Elizabeth has set it out. So if we want to, it seems to me, allow for a broader use of these ADUs in the future, and it's kind of up to the you know the town council to to make a change to this this purpose. But I think that unless we we impose a condition that says, you know, this shall be this unit shall be limited to one or two pe people who have a close personal relationship uh, with the um, with the residents of the main dwelling, and probably again, I think we probably should also say that this dwelling not be used uh, as a uh, home business or um, a home occupation because that is also um, a prohibition for an ADU. Let, we, let's talk about that for just a moment. Uh, ben, uh, my thinking is, and correct me if I'm wrong, because that is the plain language of the ordinance, uh, the plain language being uh, not only the close relationship of the occupants, but the, the no um, home occupation, that if something like that were to occur in the future, it would probably lead to a notice of violation, or am I wrong about that? Yes, I, I think that the ordinance protects that and uh, that the conditional use permit would be voided if those activities occurred. Uh, the, the zoning board, on any, as with any conditional use permit, the zoning board can add conditions to the permit. So we're, we're free to do that tonight if we want to add any conditions. And I, I understand what Joe's saying, uh, you know, the formal zoning board decision and for formal zoning board conditions versus just what the ordinance says are the standards. And there, I understand that there's a little bit of a gap there, but it would be my interpretation that that would be a violation of the conditional use permit and would thus void the, the conditional use permit if those things occurred. Yeah, thank you. That, then, Mr. Chair, correct me if I'm wrong, but if the conditional permit is not used for a year, so if it's not used as an ADU, that conditional use permit goes away, correct? And, we, and the then subsequent owner or Mr. Cotter, if he was still the owner, would have to come back before the board to reinstate that permit, correct? 
That's correct with any conditional use permit. And there, I, I know there's a requirement, and, and Ben, I'm sure you probably discussed this with Mr. Cotter, that um, that there needs to be recordation within the registry of deeds, I think within 90 days of final approval, assuming we were to approve tonight, right? That's correct. I'll uh, send uh, Mr. Cotter a, a recordable document for the registry. Michael. <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Um, I was looking at, so in looking at um, section 19.7.5, which is, which governs the creation of accessory dwelling units, there are um, under section, subsection B, there are eight requirements. <laughs> and number four talks, uh, it says any addition to the floor area of the single family detached dwelling to create the accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 15% of the floor area of the structure of the single family dwelling prior to conversion. And it, I don't think there's, I don't think there's an issue here, but it, it appears to me and Ben or maybe Mr. Carter, correct me if I'm wrong. It looks like the, that, um, that additional mudroom that's being um, constructed um, is include if you include that in floor area then the 383 square foot addition that uh, uh, to create the ADU is exactly 15 percent of the of the floor area so in in fact that mudroom that doesn't exist today must be constructed in order in order to to meet that requirement is that is that correct and, and I'm sure you probably you and your architects probably um, did that intentionally, and that's fine. Um, I just wanted to sort of bring it up. Um, I don't know if this is, uh, is this going to be, there was mention of two separate uh, building permits then. Is that, is that how that's working? And um, is, I don't know if, if as a board we want to um, require, um, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we should uh, ask Mr. Carter to build the, the mudroom first and then build the ADU, but um, I, I think we should um, at least consider some way to, to ensure that it's built um, to plan just so that requirements met. Um, just, just a thought. Yeah, those, everything you said there is accurate, Mike. Uh, and I, I talked about this with Mr. Cotter and he was planning to do the mudroom addition regardless. They want mm -hmm. a mudroom and floor, first floor laundry. And, uh, you know, it's something I've wrestled with a lot as a code officer when, when something can be done in, in two steps. Yeah. What do you do to allow that to happen? Because obviously he, he could have constructed this last month with a building permit and then come and then come to us this month but with with COVID and tough tough times finding contractors it, it just seemed unreasonable to say you you have to get that mudroom done before you can come to the zoning board. I, I totally agree and I, I don't uh, I'm not suggesting we uh, we require that in any way I just wanted to sort of bring it up and um, if it if it warrants a condition um, that the mudroom is built to plan um, in order to to meet that requirement number four in that in the section I quote uh, I referenced um, maybe that's the best way to do it I yeah. can tell you that, so we, we have we have a stamped plan from an architect that is exactly how it's going to be built yeah um, I, 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 unless, I, unless something really crazy goes awry and then I'll be coming back to you. You know, if I hit 20 feet of ledge and I can't get through it, you know, yep. I'll probably have to come back and, you know, it is Cape Elizabeth, these things do happen <laughs> in ledge. Um, so uh, that that's the only thing I can think of that it wouldn't be built exactly like that. I know I'm right up against it. I think I'm at like 14.8 or something like that percentage. Yeah. We were just trying to maximize the room for my mother. I get um, it. I, and and try, I, try I, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah, trying to convince her to move from a, a three-bedroom cape into this is has been a little bit. Uh, she wants to, but it's been you know kind of a trial. If you come to my backyard right now, it's actually painted out in the lawn, um, so she can figure out what she can bring with her. So <laughs> great, Matthew. 
Uh, yeah. I just had a follow-up question on um, a comment that Joe raised. And and I, I take the point that, that Ben uh, commented about if there's a notice of violation uh, concerning the uh, use of the, this is a subsequent sale, for example, Mr. Carter sells the property and someone else purchases it. And my, my reservation here is that um, it requires a notice of violation for the wheels of the process to occur. Um, and that doesn't seem like enough burden on the homeowner to ensure compliance with the ordinance. Um, and, and when I, I'm conflicted with these two sections dealing with um, 1975, dealing with the ADU and the duration of a conditional use approval under 1955. Um, because on page 66 of the ordinance, there's a, there's a very strong phrase that says the conditional use shall expire if the owner. Uh, those are absolute terms. And I query to um, address Joe's concern because now he's got me thinking about it um, as to a similar condition could be added that loops back um, from page 66 to talk about the requirement on, on page 181 dealing with close personal relationship issue. Um, because what I see is that I know there's the purpose under that paragraph, but that purpose is not discussed in the requirements. Um, and, and I'm just, the, the, the paragraph dealing with uh, the purpose is this, this um, um, you know, introductory language talking about the, the requirements. But when you look through the requirements, that requirement is not one of the eight requirements that, that we've been talking about. And I, I, I just query whether this is, uh, we're gonna see more of these. Uh, and it's just, that we're, we're thinking that this either the ordinance have to be revised or how do we avoid this discussion coming up every time that we have an ADU application. Um, so I'm open to comments as to whether we can, uh, if there's w willingness to do it now or, or not, and then whether there's a condition that could be added to, the, um, to our approval this evening, if we so feel so inclined. Mike, uh, I'll respond to that, Matt. I, I'm I'm not really in favor of adding the any additional um, condition. Um, I, I think uh, I think Mike explained uh, pretty clearly um, that the language of the ordinance is is pretty plain. If someone were to use it in a way that um, uh, it, it isn't consistent with the requirements. Clearly, we are approving it um, based on the application and based on, on what Mr. Carter is telling us and it's used uh, in a different way and in a way that um, that doesn't meet any of, of the, the requirements of the ordinance. Um, it's a violation, just like anyone, anyone else who has a, a home in town. If they use it uh, in a way that violates the ordinance, uh, you know they're they're going to get a, a notice of a violation. Um, you know I also question you, you talked about the ordinance um, changing and and if the uh, if the council decide does decide to change the ordinance, um, for instance, uh, in in this section um to allow say say they that that they no longer want that clause that says it's a a close family relation or something like that but if we've put that condition on it then all of a sudden we we've got um we've got an approval that uh has a condition that wouldn't have been put on it um if the if the ordinance were to change and i know that that's a it's a hypothetical and um and who knows what's going to happen in the future but um it's my belief that that the the ordinance speaks for itself, um, and uh, and and no no further conditions should be necessary. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't want to um, repeat myself. I don't think that the ordinance speaks that well for itself, and I think Matt kind of pointed it out. I mean, if I were writing an ordinance that said uh, I absolutely don't don't want this to be used in the future for um, 
uh, for, say, non-personal use, I mean, it could be written a lot better. Most of these requirements are written with the idea of, of gaining approval and, don't, and aren't forward-looking in that way. And if I were, let's say you did have a violation and I wanted to enforce the, the violation, I would have a lot easier time doing it if I could point to the court that here is a permit that said that there is a condition here that it's not to be used for non-personal uses or for more than one or two people or for home business occupation. If you get into a situation where, you know, Mr. Cotter or somebody else passes on the property and the discussion is never raised, and maybe that person goes into the, 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 the purchase thinking, hey, here's a chance for some extra income, I still think you'd be, from an equity standpoint, you'd be hard pressed to come up with a strong enforcement case short of having the black and white showing that that was an inappropriate use of, of the property. So um, it's not that I'm skeptical of, of <laughs> humans and their behavior, but I just think that it's just nice to be a little bit more explicit and to have something that's a lot more enforceable. And what I'm suggesting, as you probably understand, is not an off-the-wall suggestion. It's commonplace in a lot of other jurisdictions to do this kind of thing. In fact, some of them go by way of deed restriction, which I didn't want to suggest because I, I knew that would probably have very little resonance. But I think a, a, at least a permit condition is a start because permits run with the land and it would be in the chain for future, for future people. I think just as a matter of policy, my last words on this, this is what people as if want. They want to restrict these ADUs and until they change it, I think we have, to, we have an obligation to do that as effectively as possible. Yeah, I, I'll just add that I, I, I don't disagree with you, Joe, I, I, uh, but, but I, I don't feel like it's our job to, it is a matter of policy. I just don't think it's our job to, to make that policy. I think it's the council's job. Um, so I, 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 you know, it is what it is. We'll, we'll see. Uh, I, I'm not, I'm certainly not uh, going to fall on my sword over this. <laughs> you know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nuanced thing, but um, and, and that's just my, my take on it. Kevin, Kevin, I saw your hand up. Yeah, I, I was just going to add, I, I'm not in favor of imposing another, um, a, a special condition on this. I, I, I believe the, the council was very intentional in, in the drafting of all of these sections and how they work together. Um, just seeing how ordinances move through the town, it is not a quick and easy process that has no input from uh, people who are concerned about this. I, I, you know, the way that it's drafted, it's a little, it's a little wonky, but I, I think it makes sense. And I think it, it reflects the intent of the council. And so therefore I, I don't really want to burden um, this applicant or, or really any applicant under this section with restating our interpretation of conditions that we think are what the ordinance says, but don't actually, you know, I don't think we'd ever get them completely right with what the ordinance actually says. And the ordinance to me does speak for itself. Uh, so that, that's kind of where I come out on this. I, I would note, you know, it's, it's actually meant to come back to something Mike had said about the timing of the mudroom and everything else. I believe the mudroom and somebody, Ben, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that also has to be built for the uh, doorway between the house and the ADU. So I think that's another aspect of that, that that's required. Um, and I, and I, 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 I'm open to how we do it, um, but I do think we might need a condition in the approval just related to that permit. Um, that, that, and making that's sure right. That I'm sorry, finish up. I'm sorry about that, Kevin. Oh, no, I'm done. Yeah, I, I, I think you're right that you just mentioned that and that triggered uh, me to think back to the ordinance. I think there's a requirement that there be an interior uh, connection doorway between the, the primary residence and the accessory uh, dwelling. Um, and I'll, I'll piggyback on what Mike and Kevin said. Um, I, I don't feel like there's really any need to, to restate uh, what the ordinance already says. Uh, I think the ordinance is pretty clear as well. Uh, accessory, accessory dwelling units shall only be created where the single family character of the principal building is maintained. That's just below where they talk about the the, um, the close relationship that needs to be uh, in existence. Um, so I, I'm comfortable with, with proceeding with, um, with findings without 
essentially restating or in reinterpreting what, what the ordinance has to say, because that already exists. We know that's on the books. It's Ben's job and the town's job to enforce that as it's, as it's written. That being said, uh, before we get to the point of dealing with findings of fact, I think we need to deal, of course, with the underlying issue, which is whether we're going to uh, vote to approve um, this. I'm not he hearing uh, much in the way of uh, objections. I don't think I've heard any objections on the underlying uh, approval. So uh, you just bear with me and let me get back to what happens when I'm dealing with multiple devices here. I think we would entertain a motion to approve the request of Patrick Cotter, owner of the property at 5 Thrasher Road, map U32, lot 6-5, to create an accessory dwelling unit by adding an addition to an existing single family dwelling based on section 19-5-5 19-7-5 of the zoning ordinance, 5 Thrasher Road being located within the RC zone. I'll make that motion so moved. Kevin makes the motion. Do we have a second? Mike, yeah. we have a second. Uh, discussion on the motion. Yes, Matthew. Uh, friend, the amendments. Um, I was just looking at the um, if you're reading the first two lines of the findings of fact, there's a slight um, alteration to the way they read it. Um, but other than that, um, there's no issue for me. Uh, and if you wanted to include the third sentence as well on the motion, I guess you didn't have to do that. But uh, my query is that, um, No, I will throw my uh, my comments and we can talk about the findings of fact afterwards. All right, any other uh, discussion on the pending motion? Hearing none, all in favor. I'm in favor. I'm in favor, Michael Tadema Whelan. Joe Barbieri, aye. Kevin Just, in favor. Matt Caton, in favor. So it's unanimous. Colin Powers in favor. Oh, sorry, Colin, I cut you off. <laughs> now it's unanimous. Uh, the motion carries. Um, congratulations, Mr. Carter. We'll now deal with the findings of fact, which is is should be largely perfunctory. We'll see. Um, moving on to the findings. And I suspect there's going to be some additional uh, discussion on this based on the, the earlier discussion. We've got a proposed finding of fact one. This is a request for a conditional use permit to create an accessory dwelling unit in an existing single family dwelling located in the RC zone based on section 19-7-5 and 19-5-5 of the zoning ordinance. Excuse me, proposed finding of fact two, the subject property is 5 Thrasher Road, map U32, lot 6-5. Proposed finding of fact three, Patrick Cotter is the applicant and the owner of the property. Proposed additional finding of fact one, the proposed use will not create hazardous traffic conditions when added to existing and foreseeable traffic in its vicinity. Proposed additional finding of fact two, the proposed use will not create unsanitary conditions by reason of sewage disposal emissions to the air or other aspects of its design and or operation. Proposed additional finding of fact three, the proposed use will not adversely affect the value of the adjacent properties. Proposed additional finding of fact four, the proposed site plan and layout are compatible with adjacent property uses and with the comprehensive plan. Proposed additional finding of fact five, the design and external appearance of any proposed building will constitute an attractive and compatible addition to its neighborhood although it need not have a similar design, appearance, or architecture, and proposed additional finding of fact six, the applicant has demonstrated compliance with the requirements in section 19-7-5.b of the zoning ordinance. I would entertain a motion to approve the proposed findings of fact and the proposed additional findings of fact. Chair, I have friendly amendments. Yes. On, um... Findings of fact number two, I would suggest inserting the following words, located at 5 Thrasher Road, 
and then in the RC zone after the road. Uh, my understanding also is uh, finding of fact number three is that Mr. Carter is the co-owner of the property. Uh, and then at the bottom, number six, um, I would propose that we strike out uh, subparagraph B. So it's the entire section, not just the paragraph B that talks about requirements. That's all I have. I, I, I think all of that makes sense. I've got no problems with, with any of those friendly amendments. Uh, Mike, I, we may have uh, missed our chantlet, possibly. <laughs> um, to, you know, we talked earlier about um, perhaps a condition on the construction of that med room. May, maybe it's, it's not, uh, not necessary. I mean, if that, you know, maybe Ben can, can weigh in. I mean, if, if for some reason that mudroom is a smaller, uh, footprint than is proposed today, um, would that, would that trigger this coming back? I have personally, I have no problem. Um, you have a design that's a stamped architect plan. I have absolutely no problem having that put in the findings of fact that it will be built as designed if that will help help yeah. your mind. Yeah, thank you. I, I just wonder whether or not it should have been a condition on the-, on the No, um, we, we can make it a finding of fact if you like and that I'm perfectly fine with that. Yeah, I, I think we, we, we could do it as a finding, but I also think we're okay approving it as is. We, we have a set of plans and if, 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 he go, if he does not adhere to that plan, he would need to come back to the zoning board. And okay. I'd also point out that we've, we've approved these for new construction in the past. It's been a while, but we've, we've approved these on vacant lots where there's no house. Uh, so be a similar situation where okay. what they're what they're proposing isn't built yet, but it complies with the ordinance when it is built. Okay, I'm comfortable with that. Thanks. All right, so we had some uh, friendly amendments by, by Matthew Caton, which I think all made, made sense. Um, we, st we don't yet have a motion Or actually, I get Matthew. Did you make the motion, but with the friendly amendments? Maybe you did. I may have missed that. I just made the friendly amendments. No motion, but I move to um, uh, amend the uh, findings of fact and the additional findings of fact uh, with the friendly amendments. I'll second that. Kevin seconds. Uh, further discussion. Hearing none. All in favor. I'm in favor. Hi, Joe Barbieri. I'm in favor, Michael Tadamo Whelan. I'm in favor, Kevin Just. Colin Powers in favor. I'm Matthew Caton in favor. Very good. Uh, the motion carries. The uh, findings of fact and additional findings of fact are uh, approved by motion with uh, friendly amendments as proposed by Mr. Caton. Um, congratulations, Patrick. I hope it all goes well. Uh, thank you guys very much. I know this takes a lot of time and uh, like I said, it's interesting sitting on the other side of the table, so to speak. So I appreciate it. And uh, if it makes you feel any better, I deal with this exact same thing in Sanford. ADUs are everyone's uh, hot topic lately. We'll put it that way. So well, good, good thing teaching from home is a day uh, home business, right? Yes, that would be very bad. <laughs> We'd all be a violation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you all. I don't think we have anything else on the agenda. So uh, we'll go ahead and adjourn. Thank you, guys. Okay. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thank you all. Thanks. Good night. Ben, how are things looking for next month? Do we have anything coming up? There's another ADU coming up. Okay. Great. All right. On, on to August. Yep. All right. See you guys next month. Right, thanks. Bye. Bye, all. Bye. Have a good month. Two.